Hi, everybody. My name's Georgina Such, and I just wanted to welcome you all to the final event for the Women in Science Network for 2019. And it's really great to see a diverse range of people here today. We've got, you know, we've got academics, professional staff, we've got ECRs, and we've got students as well. And of course, the Vice Chancellor. And it's really important that we have all those groups in and we have discussion between all those groups to make this university an exciting, vibrant place to work. And that was one of the reasons why we developed the Women in Science Network, to facilitate more events like this where we had people meeting from a diverse range of groups, diverse schools across the faculty so that we could have a more collaborative, better networking, better supportive environment um, for our faculty of science. And not only that, we also want to be able to listen to your opinions, all of you, include, and all of the Faculty of Science, and find out what you guys think we can do to improve gender equity in our faculty. And so I really want to encourage you to continue to come to our events, continue to reply to emails, and give your feedback, because it's through your opinions that we can push forward and, and progress gender equity issues. And I'd, I'd like to say that they do get to the people who can make decisions, those opinions, and they do make a difference. So keep doing it. Um, and I've had a, the opportunity to talk to Alex a number of times in the last couple of months, and I've, I can honestly say that he is really committed to making an impact in gender equity, in the in gender equity space, and I think you're going to see exciting developments in the next couple of years. So that really leads me on to introducing Alex, our uh, Dean of Faculty of Science, to talk a bit about what we've already done and what we're going to do in the future. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Georgie. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Women in Science Network's end of year reception. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri, and pay my respects to their elders and families. As a faculty, we understand the value and significance of Indigenous culture and knowledge. And our commitment to increasing the representation of women in science walks hand in hand with a commitment to increasing our Indigenous workforce. As such, I'd like to extend a special welcome to my Indigenous colleagues in the room this afternoon. I'd also like to welcome the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Duncan Maskell, and thank him for attending today to hear more about the steps we've made so far and our strategies for building a happy, healthy and diverse workforce in science. So today's event is for celebrating our successes while also acknowledging that we have a long way to go. Women remain underrepresented in scientific communities and the higher up the academic ladder we go, the more significant the disparity. We know that career interruptions for parental or carers leave unduly disadvantage women. There has also been a historic lack of female role models for our younger generations of scientists and students. But we've recognised this problem and we are taking steps towards fixing it. This year we launched and welcomed the first seven participants, and I believe there's an eighth on the way, to our parental leave support scheme which allows academic staff members on parental leave to continue their research projects. This funding, which covers things like support salaries and childcare, mean that, means that a researcher no longer has to delay a project while taking time out to care for new children. We are also recognising the immense value of fellowship and have facilitated this through regular seminars and mentoring programs for academic and professional staff. We've also hosted the first public Women in Science event. 150 guests attended the Changing Science, Celebrating Women, Making a Difference in STEM M Careers during the Science Festival in August and participated in a fascinating discussion. These networking and mentoring opportunities have helped support women through the promotion process. We are pri prioritising recruitment of women uh, at levels B and C, and making a concerted effort to increasing the promotions to level D, which has our lowest percentage of female participation. In 2018, we had no applications for female academics to be promoted to level D. 
So it's wonderful to see that four of our female academics have been promoted to level D this year. And in fact, 46% of all uh, 2019 promotion applications in the Faculty of Science went to women. Not quite 50, but quite close. And given that we're at 33% or 36% 30, well, currently, that's uh, pretty good, I think. But we have a way to go. We've also increased the number of women uh, being given professorial appointments and hopefully the, um, uh, the first step in a continuing upward uh, trajectory there. I'm also particularly excited that we have two fe new female professors coming to us from outside as well as those that have been promoted or will be promoted in January. This includes Professor Nina Waddell, who received the university's only ARC Laureate Fellowship awarded in 2019, and Professor Michelle Watt, our Adrian Clark Chair of Botany, who will also be uh, coming in February. With their commencement, 40% of new professors in the Faculty of Science at the beginning of next year will be women. Looking forward, we will continue all of these successful initiatives but also create new ones. Our dedicated Women in Science Network Committee, who are responsible for today's event, are now developing a Women in Science strategy for the faculty. This will support efforts towards workforce gender parity, developing our female role models and networks, and continuing workshops and training sessions that are building the best work environment for all our staff. It will also look at how we recruit and retain female students, ensuring a strong pipeline of talent in science. For 2020, we've identified some key areas of focus. In the 2019 Dean's Fund for Science uh, call out, we particularly focused uh, on, on female students. And the money that we received from that, uh, we are now going to spend in 2020 and beyond on being able to offer female students who firstly experience disadvantage, those who are underrepresented in their field of study, especially in the physical and mathematical sciences, and those who show leadership potential. And that those uh, scholarships will be announced more formally soon. We are also developing schemes that will provide our early career researchers with access to small grants and support female academics with care uh, giving responsibilities for pre-primary children to attend conferences. Because, of course, it's not just while uh, women are on maternity leave that obstacles occur. The importance of these projects cannot be underestimated, and I'd like to thank the Women in Science Network for their continued efforts and, of course, for hosting us today. I have a strong personal commitment to develop a strong, diverse and equal workforce and I've been heartened by the positive response to our initiatives across the faculty and the willingness of many of you to get involved. Last Tuesday night, I was part of a group of women who went to firstly uh, view the Photograph 51 play by MTC about Rosalind Franklin uh, and the discovery of the structure of DNA. Uh, but then there was a dinner afterwards um, uh, with these women. And I, actually, I was the only man in the room. There were 20 people there. Uh, but it was a wonderful event, very inspiring. And I was asked, apart from whether I was feeling comfortable, and I was perfectly comfortable, that um, whether when I had uh, uh, introduced the female-only positions in the, the School of Mathematics and Statistics back in 2016, whether there was much opposition from within the school. And I was glad to say that there wasn't. In fact, there wasn't across the University of Melbourne uh, at all. There was only enthusiasm and interest. Questions, but positive responses. There was from, of course, outside the university, but that's another thing. So I'm confident that many of our uh, uh, successes will continue into the new year. Uh, and thank you for listening to me. Uh, I'll pass back now uh, to Georgie. Thank you so much for that, Alex. I think you can agree we've got some really exciting things to look forward to in the coming years. Um, and 
The other part of our event today, we wanted to highlight one of our female leaders. And of course, we've got amazing uh, female scientists at the University of Melbourne. So and we, we were interested in hearing a little bit more about one of uh, those amazing scientists. And that is, of course, Kate Smith-Miles. But before I hand over to her, I just wanted to give you just a brief bio. Uh, so she is currently an Australian Laureate Fellow and also a professor in applied mathematics and also associate dean of industry and enterprise in the Faculty of Science. She has a real focus on interdisciplinary research. She's worked in a number of different areas, including maths, engineering, IT, and has numerous collaborations across industry and also academia. She's got a particular interest and focus on doing things that are, have got societal impact. She's won a number of awards. Uh, in 2010, she was awarded the Australian Mathematical Society Medal for Distinguished Research. In 2017, she was awarded the ASIAM's EO Tuck Medal for Outstanding Research and Distinguished Service in Applied Mathematics. She, in her free time, I don't know how she does it, but she also does, gives back to her community. So she is the immediate past president of AUSTMS and a member of the ARC College of Experts from 2017 to 2009. And in the free time that she still has left, uh, she also does a number of outreach activities and she's really focused on inspiring students in the power and um, impact of mathematics. So please uh, join me in thanking Kate for joining us. Thanks, Georgina. Now I've uh, suitably hypnotised all of you. Uh, we're going to have a little chat about determination because I know this is a room full of determined people. Um, so when I was asked to speak to you um, about what it's like being a woman in a male-dominated area, uh, I thought, um, well, I could uh, talk about this kind of thing. You know, I, I've got a reputation for being quite determined and determined to succeed in a male-dominated area. And this was an interview I did last year, I think. Uh, and, you know, you can't read it, but it says things like, um, uh, I didn't expect anyone to help me succeed. Um, you know, if I choose to work in a male-dominated area, I'm not expecting anyone to help me do that. You know, th those were my attitudes. Um, and so I thought I could talk to you about this, how determined I've been to succeed. Uh, and I thought, no, um, because actually the word determined is a really interesting one. And uh, I share with you, every morning at 6 a.m. I go and do yoga, hot yoga. 35 degrees, it's beautiful. Uh, but when I walk up the stairs to my yoga studio, um, for the month of October, they had this little mantra, determination is my power. And I saw that every morning at 6 a.m. And I spent, you know, 30 days <laughs> looking at this as I walked up the stairs. Uh, I am determined, I am focused, I'm resilient. Um, can you think of a time when you were fiercely determined? How did it feel? So interesting question. How does it feel to be so determined? Uh, it's not always a good feeling to be determined. So, you know, there's a yin and a yang and, and, you know, an upside and a downside. So I wanted to share with you some personal reflections on this, hopefully not too personal, but I kind of feel that in a mentoring network sense, we're here to, to share our experiences. And so I hope you get something out of this. So yes, determination is my power, one of my powers. I'm a pretty determined person, as I know all of you are as well. But how do we harness our determination to support what's in our best interests? That's something you, you can all think about as well. Uh, you know, um, pros and cons, right? Uh, I am determined to succeed, but at what cost? You know, how far are we prepared to push ourselves to succeed? And uh, so, yeah, there's a bit of a yin and yang here, and I wanted to share that. So um, someone recently said to me, being female in a male-dominated area is a little bit like uh, accidentally walking into the wrong bathroom. Um, you, you kind of look around and you sort of think something's not quite right here. Uh, and of course, you know, all of us who've, who've worked as women in male-dominated areas know that feeling. Uh, I'm not saying that we need to get to the point of sharing bathrooms, but we certainly need to share workplaces. And, uh, and I think these days it's so much easier than it was. You know, the recent inclusion agenda and certainly the Faculty of Science and, and um, you know, most universities these days have been thinking about this for long enough that we don't have the issues we had in decades past. Um, so these kind of, from the past, these subliminal messages that you don't really belong or even direct verbal messages that, that you're not in the right place. Um, these days, I think it's, it's certainly getting easier. But what I want to share with you uh, is, is this notion of like a red flag to a bull. You know what happens when you show a red flag to a bull, right? Charges. So um, yeah, uh, I'm a bull. 
and uh, I'll share with you a few red flags that I've encountered in my career. And, and there's early red flags, and I'll tell you how I reacted, and then there's more recent red flags and how I've learned to react. Um, so reflections from the bull ring, um, what I've learned from the fight, um, and yeah, if anyone should recognise red flags, it's, it's a bull. Uh, we should be learning. So red flag number one for me was back in high school, um, where I had, you know, my fair share of those maths teachers that would tell you why you couldn't do maths, right? So girls can't do maths because we can't visualise in 3D, apparently. Um, bizarre, you know, hello. I, I'm living in a 3D world and I can't visualise it, strangely, whatever. Um, so that was a little red flag. That's me getting angry. Um, and so that was year 10, I think. So the effect on all my friends in the class was, um, oh, so that's why I find it hard. Mm, I won't choose maths as an elective next year. The effect on me was I'm going to prove him wrong. So I did prove him wrong. I went on to do really well in maths and decided I wanted to become a mathematician. Red flag number two over here. Uh, first year university, a lecturer said, my subject's really tough. 50% of you in this class are going to fail. And of all the women in this class, all of you will fail. Just staying, just statistically speaking, you're like, yeah, historically, that's what's always happened. Just, just saying. Okay, so thanks for sharing. Um, the effect on some female students I overheard was, oh, I better drop out before the census date then. Uh, the effect on me and two or three of my friends was, well, we're going to prove him wrong. Okay, determined to prove them wrong. Uh, even when I made it to associate professor um, and I was going on my first maternity leave and I said to my um, old male mentor that I'd been allocated uh, that I was going on maternity leave and his reaction was, oh my God, what have you done? Don't you know what you've done? You have killed your research career. And I got really upset by that. You can see the bull's getting angrier and angrier. Um, I was really upset that that was his reaction. It was not a, oh, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. Oh, you're going to be a great mother. No, it was, you have killed your research career, almost like you silly person. Yeah. Um, so the effect on me was I am just so determined to prove him wrong. This is not the end of my research career. Why can't I have a baby and still continue to get ARC grants and, and write high quality papers? Why can't I? I'm going to prove him wrong. So what happened then? Well, so I went on maternity leave for three months at the end of 2002. Uh, I returned full time at the start of 2003. I applied straight away because it was January and that's what you do. I wrote three ARC grants, one discovery and two linkage grants. Um, I got them all. And by the end of that year, I had a baby and I had three ARC grants, oh, in addition to the one I already had, uh, and I had 12 PhD students and everything felt a little bit out of control, as you can imagine. Uh, and so, uh, guess what? <laughs> guess what happened? I, look, I could be dramatic and say that this was a metaphorical breakdown. It actually was a literal breakdown on the freeway with my car. Uh, so I don't want to be overly dramatic. But um, I had a breakdown on the freeway uh, because I was so busy, I didn't have time to get petrol. Um, and cars need petrol. So I was, <laughs> I was so busy being a mother to a baby at home that was still being breastfed and being at work full time and proving everyone wrong. I was so busy with these two modes that I was in that stopping and getting petrol was not something that I felt I could justify. So I broke down on the freeway. And I, while I was sitting there, um, yeah, there might have been a few tears, um, waiting for the RACV to come, uh, I kind of thought, oh, no, nah, this isn't working. Something is wrong with this situation. And what is wrong is that I am so determined to prove some old man wrong that I'm not looking after myself. Right? So sometimes you've got to ask what you're determined to do and why and whether it's the right thing to be determined about. So we have some choices. We can either charge at a red flag or we can ask actually why is that person holding a red flag at me? What is their problem that they're holding that red flag at me? So sometimes a thoughtless comment is not about me, it's about them. And you have to be able to recognise that. Their biases. So less yang and a bit more yin. Right? So that was um, 2003. Gee, it's been many years now, and now I'm a bit more yin. Yoga helps. Um, and so I've had, I'll share with you three more red flags that have been post that time, and you can see the difference in how I've reacted. So 2005, some colleagues were telling me I should apply for promotion to full professor, and uh, the same mentor, who was horrified that I was going on maternity leave, said, I don't think you're ready to be a full professor because, well, what are you actually really internationally known for? 
Um, you're very broad and not very deep. And to be a professor, you have to be super deep. So I took his advice uh, on board and I thought, I have a choice of how this affects me. You'll notice there's no angry bull down here. It didn't anger me because I've started to realise that people can have their own opinion. It doesn't mean I have to react, right? Choice of how this affects me. I could say, oh, he's so right. Um, I need to just focus on one thing and get really, really deep and apply again in a few years' time. Or I could say, I think he's wrong. I'm going to challenge his view. I'm going to argue that my breadth is my strength. My breadth enables me to collaborate with so many people and achieve everything I want to achieve. And I don't feel a need to go deeper. I go deep when I need to, but I'm going to argue that that is my strength. And that's what I did. You have to have the confidence sometimes that you're going in the right direction. And that's the argument I made to the committee that they believed. So that was 2005. Many years later, I'm skipping, uh, there's probably some other red flags in between that I won't bore you with, but uh, another red flag. I was head of school and I had a dean who would say things to me like, ah, what you're giving me is management and I'm asking for leadership. Um, do you know the difference between leadership and management? I'm going to spend $20,000 and send you on a leadership course at Harvard Business School. Um, and then you'll learn the difference between leadership and management. Well, he did spend that money and I did learn some things. But one thing I learned was that Harvard Business School leadership course has all these case studies and it's very much one style of what a leader looks like. It's a kind of alpha male hero type leader. I came back and I did another leadership course, a women in leadership course run by Christine Nixon, our former police commissioner. And that was really eye-opening because it showed me that there's actually many different leadership styles. And actually there's nothing wrong with my leadership style. It was quite authentic to me and it was working for me. And I didn't need someone telling me that I needed a different leadership style, their leadership style. So choice of how this comment affects me. Uh, I could become more alpha male, um, not authentic, but I could try to be more alpha male. Um, and have a leadership style that he was demanding of me. Or I could say, no, I challenge your view. My leadership style is absolutely fine, thanks. Um, and there's more than one way to be an effective leader. Uh, so, you know, vision, communication skills, people skills and authenticity are really key to effective leadership. Um, and having confidence that that will be fine for me was important. Uh, and even when I was a laureate fellow, people still wave red flags at you. Um, don't think that they ever stop. <laughs> Um, but it's how you react to them that matters. So in 2016, I had someone say to me, what you're doing isn't good mathematics. Mathematicians don't do all this interdisciplinary stuff, you know. Where's the, the mathematical rigour or the, you know, mathematics can be a little bit hierarchical. Um, all this collaborative work you're doing doesn't belong in a mathematics department. You know, if you want to collaborate with biologists, go and get a job in medicine, that kind of attitude. Well, how does that affect me? I saw how it affected some more junior colleagues. They were very upset by it. Um, but I've got to the point where I can have confidence that the direction that I'm going is right. Um, so a choice, I could focus on some deeper mathematical questions, drop all my collaborations, um, just conform with what somebody is telling you um, to be respected by some person waving a red flag, or have confidence that my vision for what a modern mathematician should be doing is correct. So that's what I've done, including changing universities. Um, where my, my vision for what mathematics uh, is and the importance of collaboration is um, very well supported. So determination is certainly my power, um, but determined to prove everyone wrong, that's not what we should be determined to be. Um, it's not the right goal. Determined to succeed, certainly, but how do you define success? How should you define success? For me, what I've become is determined to find balance in all aspects of my work uh, with my beautiful children, that I love my work, and the me time. Um, you know, Georgina didn't mention, I, I squeeze in time for playing the cello in an orchestra as well and yoga and all sorts of things. So it's really important that you have those extra things that you do when you're not being, you know, an academic or a mother and breaking down on the freeway, that I find time for filling up the car with petrol, <laughs> I find time for making beautiful music. Uh, all these things are important in my life. Um, I am determined to do my best according to me what I think is important, to feel proud of my achievements, to feel respected, even if I have to, you know, move positions to, to feel that respect. Um, determined to make a contribution to society, to have an impact and to, to leave a legacy. Um, that's what I'm determined to be. And interestingly now, at my yoga studio, the month of November, at 6 a.m. when I climb the stairs, confidence is my power, which is exactly what I've just been talking about, having the confidence to know that you've got the right path for you.
and not letting those red flag holders um, you know, rattle you. Um, so think of a time when you were brim brimming with confidence. How did you feel? Amazing. So I've learned a lot from being a mother. I've learned a lot from yoga. Um, it's not about touching your toes. It's what you learn on the way down. Um, I hope that you've got something that you can personally take away from me sharing my personal story. I hope it wasn't too personal. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kate. That was awesome. Um, we've been having Kate on our list to talk uh, for a number of, well, ever since she joined, pretty much. So um, thank you very much. We're very, very appreciative. Um, and I think the message about authenticity really um, rings true to me. Um, I'm not going to talk for long. Um, we've covered a lot already, and we're keen to get to food and drink. Um, I wanted to say thank you to some people who have contributed to our seminars um, this year. And we've also um, partnered with CCAN, so Science Early Career Net Academic Network, um, uh, on two of the, the seminars as well. So I want to say thank you to Sandra McLaren, Colette Boscovich, Anne Roberts, Petty Fairbank, Claire Farrell, Fiona Fiddler, um, and Patricia Werner, who came. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended and will attend going forward because we hope to partner with other networks within the university going forward to leverage the opportunities. Um, on the professional side of things, we had a great professional careers event last month um, where the Lord Mayor Sally Cap was our special guest speaker and she was fantastic, very engaging, very inspirational. Um, and she joined um, our senior leaders, Julie Wells, David Akers and Jill Carter in the um, panel discussion, that was great. And we had a lot of people turn up, about 100 people in the audience and many could join us um, afterwards for our networking lunch. So that was really good. Um, so Georgie and I will continue to communicate with you um, some ideas for 2020 and beyond, and we'll look for your feedback and your ideas going forward and how we can collaborate. Um, some of the initiatives have already been flagged by Alex um, and more information to come. For now, I encourage you to stay and network where possible, um, have something to drink and eat and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.